I am Returned, and today we will discuss the somewhat misunderstood Inquisition of the Imperium of Man. One of the most powerful organisations that exists within humanity's empire of the Imperium in the dark and far future. The Inquisition's foundation was formed at the end of the period known as the Heresy under the orders of the Emperor of Man, instructing one of his very closest aides, Malkador the Sigilite, to locate the most pure and devout members of the Imperium, who displayed not only an absolute commitment to the Imperium and its ideals, but also individuals who were of a naturally inquisitive nature. At its most fundamental level, the Inquisition is something of a feudal organism, that is to say it exists largely outside the default structure and chain of command of integrated Imperial organisations, and is therefore outside of most ordinary levels of authority. This means that in essence it stands free from any oversight by the wider Imperium and answers only to the ranking members within its own orders. This quite obviously was initially designed to prevent any contamination or restrictions by outside forces, but has over millennia as the Inquisition has slowly become more fractured actually created far more severe problems as its own internal system of oversight is pretty difficult to measure, and that really is probably the best way to frame it. The broad spectrum of members that form the Inquisition are permanently tasked with a range of objectives, including but not limited to investigating any and all leads that could create situations posing a high risk or threat to the Imperium, and which if left unchecked could potentially cause destabilising situations to the standard order of things, seeking out those members of the Imperium which do not conform to the assumed order and are therefore considered dangerous maintaining the status quo of the Imperium's upper echelons, fighting the wide-ranging enemies of humanity and then destroying them where they are found. However, their most commonly unknown focus is on investigating the ways by which the Emperor of Man could be returned to humanity, but we'll get into that later. Of course, their most known focus is on eradicating any contamination or incursion by the forces of chaos. In this important role, they will often collaborate with the specialist Astartes, known as the Grey Knights, and the Emperor's Holy Sororitas, who also overlap with the Imperium's Ecclesiarchy, making the Sororitas adept in this role as they carry with them the light of the Emperor. And we will probably be looking at them also very soon. As we pass by the end of Millennium 41 and into the age of the Ultima founding, a new leader for the Imperium, the Inquisition itself in the modern age has shifted greatly since its inception, and yet the Inquisition remains a mysterious and greatly feared branch of the Imperium. Individual Inquisitors may sometimes go for large portions of their career entirely unseen, locked in concentrated specific investigations in dark corners of the Imperium while others will bank on the fear of their reputation and utilise a very deliberately visible security force to intimidate and secure objectives backed up by their near to unconstrained powers. If an Inquisitor is seen by ordinary members of society, it is almost certainly because they either do not care or that being seen was their deliberate intention. Although Inquisitors are well known for some dramatic events, it is in fact more usual that they will remain in the shadows and will instead conduct investigations by means of a team of assistants, an entourage of acolytes, and may only reveal themselves to bring down the most merciless consequences to those in their line of sight, bringing their missions to a sharp conclusion. Although, to be clear, many Inquisitors will undoubtedly be active in their investigations and can also very much participate in larger battles. I often think of their role being more of that of the master to their acolyte apprentices. They are more akin to a judge who will determine the final fate of those who are brought to their attentions, because while they are master investigators, few carry their ability to rule in judgement over others at almost any level of authority. And this is their most powerful role as decision makers, deciders of events that may define systems, galactic sectors and even millennia defining decisions. It is this role of deciding the fate of billions with a word that surely far eclipses any minor day-to-day -day choices they may make about other individual Imperial Governors, Xenos or Heretics. While it may not always seem apparent, Inquisitors, broadly speaking, see things in a far wider contextual perspective than most other senior figures within the Imperium, and this is because they're taught very early on that it is critical to understand the value 
of things from a far grander perspective than just the worth of the individual. Because to an inquisitor, an individual's personal sacrifice, while undoubtedly tragic, and this can be even more painful if it were one of their own entourage, it still stands in the wider scale as being relatively meaningless. This is to be fair understandable when their highest overarching objective remains the lasting survival and endurance of humanity. So for many within the Inquisition, they'll approach many problems using an ends justifying the means perspective, which as we know has on more than one occasion led to some fairly drastic consequences, most notably an ongoing campaign of exterminatus that obliterated countless populated human worlds by Inquisitor Cryptman, who considered that in the scale of the Galactic Imperium, a string of planets being turned into ash was wholly acceptable, but it was later judged not to be the case, and he was excommunicated by his fellow Inquisitors. But it stands as a powerful example of the perspective Inquisitors are capable of seeing things from. And that is to say, they are willing to annihilate entire human planets for a broader victory, billions of souls. This along with many other more specific issues what make Inquisitors an absolutely terrifying faction within the Imperium. While many will use carefully considered and well-reasoned judgement, others will be invested in largely academic or even philosophical matters. But there are also a broad quantity of Inquisitors who are either willfully excessive in their use of horrific violence against both humans and aliens, or those who quite literally accept their need to use the corrupting tools of chaos to achieve objectives that they see as being necessary, and considering themselves thereby as martyrs. If it were not clear by now, I will explain it very simply. Inquisitors do not fit one stereotypical mould. They are in fact a complex faction within the Imperium, and while some are, yes, harrowing executioners, who walk an extremely thin line between being actual enemies of the Imperium, others are highly skilled at investigation and genuinely do critical work in protecting the Imperium from its worst threats and from its own internal corruption issues. Inquisitors form a very broad spectrum of different factions and ideologies and cannot be summarised in one grotesque caricature as a destroyer of worlds. Yet in saying this, for the worlds and citizenry of the Imperium, Inquisitors are not usually seen as an especially positive thing. This is of course debatable because if said Inquisitor were to stop a, say, demonic incursion from subsequently consuming an entire hive city, or preventing some rogue psyker from twisting all of those mortal citizens on a world into doing his bidding, as has literally happened in one instance, then they might not be seen so unfavourably. On the other hand, if they decree a whole section of a hive city to be purged with fire, it's understandable why they might not be seen as especially constructive. Inquisitors, you see, may choose to enact actions designed to prevent potential contaminations or destabilising conflicts from spiralling out of control, but their solutions can objectively end up causing more damage than the initial problem itself. Although again, this is likely pretty subjective. Inquisitors after all see things as we explained in a wider perspective, which doesn't help the perception of them as being disconnected, emotionless, power-mad destroyers of human spirit. Understanding the behaviour and role of Inquisitors though means as a result many planets will do all that they can to avoid the focused attentions of an Inquisitor, as their leadership will know that it will almost inevitably invite an acute or prolonged period of investigation for a world, and there are a few situations where that will not lead to some trouble, not to mention for its citizens, traders, and even potentially disrupt or lead to the execution of some within its ruling hierarchy. Inquisitor's broad, disconnected outlook, coupled with an often merciless execution of action, has given rise to the perception of them as being ruthless individuals, who will mete out terrifying acts of capital punishment against citizens, sentient aliens, or even demanding exterminatus against entire worlds, and it is rightly deserved for some Inquisitors. However, as we will learn, it is also a caricature in relation to how many Inquisitors actually operate. The always quick to declare heretic Inquisitor is truly a highly simplistic and overtly extreme representation that makes little to no effort to understand the far more interesting, constantly shifting and layered ideologies and factions which exist behind this cartoonish facade. So if Inquisitors are not simply all heretic seeking all the time, what is it that Inquisitors are in fact all about?
As the Imperium continues to feel the grossly bloated strain it must bear, it carries both the gargantuan weight of its vast organisations coupled with an impossibly complex bureaucracy. The Inquisition stands unfettered by such considerations and is instead free to operate wherever and however it sees fit. With an open remit to combat threats to mankind, the Inquisition operates outside of other Imperial organisations, though it maintains absolute authority over them. In practice, the Inquisition must be more political than its mandate allows. Though their power derives from the Emperor, even the Inquisition must exercise cautious judgement, for it also relies on the other parts of the Imperium for its subsequent resources. So while it's undoubtedly true that Inquisitors have the authority and power to carry out such judgments, most of the time Inquisitors dedicate a significant amount of their time toward philosophical considerations and investigation. They'll seek out specific individuals, follow up leads, commit to years if not decades of academic research combined with their travel around the Imperium hoping to uncover further leads or reveal dark schemes as we've seen with Inquisitors like Inquisitor Eisenhorn. But as with many things in the Imperium, it can regularly be the case that by the time an Inquisitor hears of a suspicious cult, a gang or disruptive character, they may have been operating for some time, and it's only when their activities have become embedded within the daily goings-on of a hive city or galactic sector do they begin to come to the surface. Then this is complicated by the fact that merely tracking down a sole individual, whilst important, would likely not be sufficient in and of itself, and so they'll need to carry out further diligent inquiries, often using an entire team of investigators and aides, who will collectively attempt to get to the root of the problem, and certainly these investigations may then result in severe methodologies and consequences that we so often hear about that characterise inquisitors. But those are the end of the process, it's not all the work that has come before. What is critical in understanding why an Inquisitor holds so much power is in understanding that every single Inquisitor represents the collective Inquisition. When they speak, they speak for all, in theory anyway. And so they wield the massive power of the entire organisation behind them. The word of an Inquisitor is absolute and beyond reproach, except by other Inquisitors. So joining the ranks of these most powerful individuals for the men and women of the Inquisition are amongst some of the most vigorously tested, intensively trained and motivated individuals that are produced by humanity. They demand the greatest respect, but for more reasons than simply their personal abilities and achievements. Because as we know, Inquisitors wield some of the most far-reaching powers given to individuals within the Imperium coupled with also an unrelenting determination to purge its enemies wherever they may be found, this is but one reason why Inquisitors are greatly feared within the Imperium. To avoid the monolithic, slow processes that are the bane of other Imperial organisations and any number of annihilated worlds, the Inquisition is organised at only a most fundamental level. And this is so that a singular Inquisitor can demand anything of any world or servant of the Emperor, be they a pleb citizen, through to even those at the highest levels. Except that in reality, high level demands do not commonly occur, because as much as the Inquisition understands its power, it also understands that certain things have to be handled carefully. This is of course goes both ways in that other groups like the Militarum or the Astartes will handle Inquisitors with guarded caution, yet also understand that they are a very important asset and will generally, where necessary or asked, aid them. It all depends, as per usual, on the context of any given situation. As with all aspects of the Inquisition, the matter of recruitment is not centralised, and the power to invest others into its ranks lies with the Inquisitors themselves. Some do not recruit at all and will spend decades in the pursuit of their enemies, dedicating themselves to their duties within their own lifetime. Others will feel it is one of their burdens to bring about the next generation of Inquisitors to carry forward the battle that they must wage. Many Inquisitors, especially those who believe in the Emperor's grand plan, can leave such matters to chance or perhaps fate. Picking a suitable candidate or candidates from amongst those individuals whose paths they may just come across, whereas other Inquisitors are more rigorous in their pursuit of an apprentice, committing a proportion of their time seeking out suitable candidates, perhaps from amongst the ranks of other Imperial organisations. There are no consistent criteria of age or physical condition required to be suitable for investiture into the Inquisition. Proof of intelligence and loyalty are the key requisites, and often these aspects of a person's character cannot be properly judged until later in life. 
Should a human youth still in their teenage years demonstrate exceptional ability, they may be considered for recruitment. But unlike the Astartes, this is not common practice for the Inquisition. On the whole, Inquisitors will take note of individuals that are free thinking, possessed of willpower and determination and unflinching principles. Not something easy to find in the Imperium, you might think. But if they do find a suitable person, they will then become part of that Inquisitor's retinue, perhaps serving in a more minor capacity while the Inquisitor continues their ongoing evaluation. Those that prove their worth working with the Inquisitor will then be taken into their master's or mistress's greater confidence. Over several years, the apprentice will learn what they can of the Inquisitor's knowledge and in time will take on more and more duties. Some Inquisitors refer to these semi-qualified individuals as interrogators, though they're also known as novitiates, neophytes or approbators. Such individuals may undertake missions on their own or control operations in concert with the Inquisitor, but they're still subordinate until their master or mistress fully invests them. It normally requires the consent of three Inquisitors or an Inquisitor Lord to pass on the full powers of an Inquisitor and grant an Inquisitorial seal, so Inquisitors cannot do this just on their own. Though there have been occasions where this has not been necessary or an immediate situation has dictated that the Apprentice take on full Inquisitorial responsibilities immediately. This is likely if an Inquisitor were to be suddenly killed, then their Apprentice will inherit their Inquisitorial seal and may fulfil the role of an Inquisitor, but this is subject to repeal by another Inquisitor. Interrogators may pass from one Inquisitor to another as fate and necessity dictates. It is in this period that the ideals of the Inquisitor passed on and spread, and through this generational growth, the factions and institutions that make up the Inquisition are propagated across the centuries and indeed millennia. As well as their ideological outlook, the student will also learn what their tutor knows of the internal workings of the Inquisition, or well, that is to say, those facts which the Inquisitor feels is right and proper. It is an important tradition amongst Inquisitors that each of them earns the knowledge that is theirs, as well as the respect of their peers. Such wisdom cannot be freely given nor taken without effort, for it devalues the knowledge itself. Inquisitors are also far from being a clearly defined benefit to the Imperium. Often they have as readily created devastating situations for humanity as much as they seek to protect it and lay out careful preparations for its future. So it is highly debatable just how beneficial the Inquisition actually is. On many levels, they do an essential and important task that few other groups could handle. On the other side of the coin, they have a habit of dealing with things in a fairly extreme way, often to suit their own agenda, which likely no one signed off on. Of course, with all of that said, to your ordinary citizen, one Inquisitor may look just like another in their common uniform of black and red, adorned with inquisitorial and imperial embellishments, there is a more diverse, even fractured ideological side to the Inquisition, and this goes beyond the basic structures we understand them to maintain in the Ordo Xenos, Hereticus, and Malleus. They also split into two core schools of thought known as the Puritan and the Radical. Even then, this is not the end of the matter, nor is it so clear-cut. The nature of philosophical perspective within the Inquisition is complex and brings a new understanding to what it means to be an Inquisitor. For the Inquisition to your common pleb citizen is just a scary figure who can kill with a word, a person who you would be a fool to cross and who wields immense power in all respects. But this representation is very simplistic and is very much just the most commonly observable view of what we consider an Inquisitor to be. Inquisitors can operate entirely independently, but much more regularly they have the assistance of a retinue. These aides are often referred to as generally acolytes, henchmen or agents, and they wield considerable power in their own right, because while not being full Inquisitors, for some of their ranks they are to all extents Inquisitors in waiting. This is a relatively straightforward aspect of an Inquisitor's general operation, because they are in essence simply assistants who will have specific roles and skills, there's not much more to it than that and they can originate from really any Imperial citizen anywhere in the galaxy also. Within each category of assistant, however, they can have either one role or multiple roles. Acolytes, for example, can have anything like eight or more specific roles and variations, whereas a demon host or an arcoflagellant fits that specific role and nothing more. A base acolyte is simply known as such and is very much a low-level servant, but still considered an agent of the Inquisition. A proven acolyte is someone who has completed multiple missions and brought up to a next level of trust and operates more independently. 
a trusted acolyte is again the next up with more responsibility and may work remotely for some time in, say, gathering information or preparing operations. A throne agent is the next grade, and they are a highly trusted member of an inquisitorial group, as well as having the power that that comes with. A prime is a lead acolyte of a warband. A legate investigator is usually assigned the important but tedious task of sifting through mountains of detail, be that questioning under duress hundreds, sometimes thousands of suspects, or ploughing through deep piles of documentation. Some inquisitors will invest in legates and dispatch them on investigations simply to stir up what may be lurking beneath the mud, using them as literal and open bait to draw heresy and dark forces out into the open. An explicator is the next up and they are the first true grade of an inquisitor in waiting. They will at this first grade learn what it means to be an inquisitor, which means essentially learning the tools of the trade or some might say the tools of torture. To pass this grade, they must both be technically capable, and it goes without saying, mentally strong. Only those who excel will continue to serve their mentors. The next grade is an interrogator, and this description is fairly self-explanatory. However, if they please their mentoring inquisitor enough with their service, they may be granted to carry what is called an inquisitional rosette. This rosette is more than just a token symbol of achievement or the value of its composition. Each bears the inquisitional symbol and is also a sophisticated means of identification keyed to an individual inquisitor. This makes obvious sense because without such a token, it would be very easy for traitors to impersonate an inquisitor, which could create, of course, all manner of trouble. So creating a fake or to say fool a rosette is no easy feat to achieve because it utilizes a complex system of biorecognition and DNA scanning technology. It would be very rare for lowly acolytes to be granted a copy of their master's rosette. Usually, it's only given to demonstrate an inquisitor's great trust on the part of their aid, and as such, it should rightfully be a very rare occurrence. It would be extremely unusual for an acolyte below the grade of interrogator to be granted such a powerful honor, not to mention also being very likely dangerous. Then lastly, we have those who have risen to the ranks of High Interrogator. Any acolyte at this stage has all but assumed the rank of a true Inquisitor, and they will likely be operating essentially as such, but still under the respective authority and guidance of their mentor, who will by now have spent many years working together and knowing all there is about the Inquisition and the horrors facing humanity. The reason they were not yet granted the position of full Inquisitor may simply be a matter of an Inquisitor's personal preferences. Maybe they're waiting for that one small thing that they wanted to see appear before they feel everything is rightfully clicked, before they're granted a position of a full Inquisitor of the Imperium. Now all of that of course is merely, merely the ranking as we said usually for acolytes. We then also have the Inquisitorial Associates themselves and the various different roles that they play. And it would be too much to get into each role specifically, as they have varying depths of their own background to speak of. So just in short, we have firstly the Adeptus Sororitas, who should be fairly known by most as the Sisters of Battle. This is the all-female militant wing of the Ecclesiarchy, and they have some crossover with the Inquisition, and so can be thought of as their associates dependent on their specific outlook, of course. Then we have the Archoflagellants, not really associates, they are the nightmarish weaponized slaves, heretics put to work by a process of conversion into drone-like flailing horrors who will inevitably perish in battle, thrashing themselves to pieces against some miscellaneous foe. Next you also have the Assassins, who have various temples to their specific focus. The most common are the Eversaur, Calidus, Calexus, and Vindicare. There are also others less well known, like the Venenum and Vanus. Not forgetting, of course, the Death Cult Assassins, who are more likely seen to be physically accompanying an Inquisitor than those of the other temples. The next discipline of Inquisitorial Assistants are known as Churgans. As horrifying as that name might sound, they're basically medics of a sort, and are usually quite ordinary human beings, or as ordinary as you may come by within the Imperium on active service anyway. The only caveat is that they will usually happily employ their expert knowledge of anatomy in the act of gaining knowledge through torture as they might through healing those wounded in firefights, so they're not entirely blameless of some slightly questionable activities. Next are Inquisitional Cultists, and they are pretty much as they sound, although their origin is obviously not one of the heretic, they are more like fanatical religious sects in worshipping the Emperor. Again, they have myriad cults dotted all across the Imperium, some more disturbing than others, and also again dependent on the outlook of an Inquisitor, they could very likely be seen as either a loyalist or a heretic in their own right. 
a demon host is very much an entity only to be seen in the presence of a radical inquisitor, it is essentially a restrained and trapped demon who the inquisitor may converse with or on rare occasions allow them to use their powers to achieve some goal. This is very much in line with the radical outlook of the ends justifying the means. The next assistant for Inquisitors are Desperados. Despite having something of a silly title, they are akin basically to mercenary bounty hunters and not to be underestimated at all. Interestingly though, they can even have previously been criminals and although exhibiting highly questionable actions, their skills are often seen as outweighing any moral or ethical actions they may have formerly committed in the eyes of an Inquisitor. Although again, this is probably very much dependent on the outlook of the specific Inquisitor. However, the role of Desperados and the fact that some of these can be criminals who have potentially committed horrible crimes within, say, a hive city, the fact that Inquisitors look past that should highlight that Inquisitors are not really like the police authority or security authority for the Imperium as a whole. They look in a wider sense and it's, it goes much deeper and more philosophical, more ideological in terms of what Inquisitors are about than just this guy is bad, this guy is good. It's, it's much more complicated. And then we have sitting somewhat within this category of assistant are those that are known as cult stalkers. These are usually recruited by the Arbites, possibly at the discretion of an Inquisitor where necessary, and are basically infiltrators who will learn more about these shadowy cults. And again, their criminal background will actually help lend them credibility in infiltrating these groups. Next we have what are called familiars, and these are things like the cherubim, servo skulls, cyber eagles that accompany inquisitors. They're basically all those various cybernetic adaptions of living things to aid an inquisitor in one way or another. The cherubim are more like servitors, these are the kind of strange baby-like sort of things that you see floating around with wings, almost like cherubs, but they're obviously far more disgusting than that. But these are not captured human babies, they're actually usually vat grown, and strangely they began to appear about two millennia after the heresy. While they are servitor-like in the sense that they will obey the will of their masters via a mind impulse unit, and without this they are not much more than just strange, frightened, instinctive drones. They usually will also have some obvious element of religious symbolism in them being kind of pure and untainted as opposed to servitors who are usually failed humans who have been condemned and are serving a punishment. Servo skulls are of course the very recognisable floating beeping skulls which will generally perform all manner of administrative tasks, although they can be used for anything from medical operation to military recon. Inquisitors will often use them as scouting units or for recording various details of investigation. Interestingly, unlike servitors, servo skulls are usually made from the skulls of highly devout worshippers of the Emperor. It's seen in fact as being a very high honour for yourself to serve beyond death and continue in whatever means possible to aid the Emperor and the Imperium serving as a servo skull. Cyber Eagles are a curious and fairly more straightforward one in carrying out simple tasks of relaying information. They're basically an artificial construct. They'll generally be used for recon, observation, even combat. However, many familiars can also boost the psychic power of an Inquisitor, be that in telepathic ability, general awareness to threats, or psychic amplifiers for offensive purposes. Hierophants or Hierophants are unfortunately designated a title that is also shared with the nightmarish titanic bioorganisms of the Xenos Tyranid, but they are at a base level devout religious followers of the Ecclesiarchy. However, obviously this is not all that they bring to the table. They have very specific roles like Drill Abbot, Forsaken Priest and Exorcist. They need not necessarily have entirely religious backgrounds, Drill abbots, for example, are often surviving members of the Imperial Guard who, for obvious reasons, attribute this to the Emperor. They school students at the Schola Proginium, which are specialist schools used by the Ecclesiarchy to train upcoming officers and officials. The Drill abbots are known for their combat skills and extreme discipline, and as such they make equally good members for an Inquisitor's retinue. Exorcists also go by the title of Banisher for what should be obvious reasons. Forsaken priests are part of a faction known as Ablationists that we'll come to later. They basically still believe in the righteousness of the Emperor and the Imperium, but that the only way to achieve this is to allow oneself to become damned. And they are of course what is known as, within the Inquisition, Radicals. 
Mutants are a strange choice to accompany Inquisitor, as you might think that those genetically wounded by millennia of conflict with all manner of chemical or irradiating weaponry, the age of strife, or just poor conditions of living should make mutants prime targets for extermination by Inquisitors. In the more modern age of the Imperium, they are seen as those who have somehow deviated spiritually and have been punished as a consequence. So mutants are sadly victims of the horrifying conditions of the 41st millennium and their only crime of existing is usually twisted by those who seek to frame it as evidence that will further validate their religious beliefs about the emperor or the ecclesiarchy. It is quite tragic that mutants often simply long for the ordinary human life, even as bleak as that can be, but instead they must exist as a permanent underclass living in usually appalling squalor. However, for an inquisitor this can have its advantages, as mutants are not only all but invisible to your ordinary human, not literally of course, but they will actively be dismissed or assumed to be seeking food or shelter purely for their own interests and having no wider agenda or needs. So mutants therefore make excellent agents for an inquisitor who may want someone to wander into a sector or overhear conversations without arousing suspicion. For the mutant, they will undoubtedly serve with loyalty because a chance for redemption and reward comes very rarely to those condemned to a life of pain and suffering. Psychers are another regular aid for Inquisitors, who after all are usually Psychers themselves, and this again shouldn't be a great surprise considering the tasks Inquisitors are generally involved in. And these can obviously vary in power and ability, but as with all Psychers, the important thing to remember is that they can simply be loyal associates who form a strong bond as part of an Inquisitorial retinue. They may shield or help to amplify the Inquisitor, or have their own powerful, unique abilities like exceptional telepathy. But psychers also segue into those who are related to this skill, in the form of what are known as penitents. Now, inquisitorial penitents are not the same as those used by the sororitas in their penitent machines. Penitents for an inquisitorial retinue are usually rogue psychers who have been captured and put through a process of brutal interrogation. And during this inevitably harrowing process, should they not simply die, a rogue psyker may come to understand the gravity of their crime and beg to continue serving the emperor, having realized the true nature of things. They'll continue to then humbly serve the inquisitor and may even have gained some highly specialized insights based on their former unsanctioned heretical activities. However, for these kind of psychers to have a cordial relationship with their inquisitor is actually not that common. In fact, more common, a rogue psyker will end up becoming what is known as a bound penitent or a penitent witch. They have essentially failed to repent and instead will be chained and accompany the inquisitor, whilst being anointed with various oils and psychic wards. And the reason for all this is that they essentially become a psychic lightning rod. Their role is to have any psychic attack directed towards an inquisitor jump into them and dissipate through their body. Of course, this could also very much damage them horribly, even to the point of death, but that's basically entirely the point. Penitents can be what is also known as blanks, these are nulls or pariahs. They are basically a polar opposite to a psyker. Their mere presence with a psyker creates discomfort and pain and can even nullify psychic abilities. Their presence can be extremely uncomfortable for some inquisitors, but sometimes this can be worth the benefit of them as an invaluable tool. A curious, although not technically official, aid are what are known as reclamators. And I'll take a moment to expand on these characters because they are unusually a designation of tech priest, which as you'll likely agree is somewhat surprising. But reclamators are tasked with redeeming raw minerals from old and damaged systems to scavenge parts and are tasked with the essentially endless cycle of minor repairs needed to keep a ship flying or a hive's infrastructure from collapsing under its own weight. Although they will have an army of workers below them to do menial and extremely dangerous operations, by necessity a reclamator's skills will regularly begin to stray into a higher understanding of machinery and technology than most within the Mechanicus and certainly in the Imperium. And so this can lead them to focus their worship of the machine god in a fragmentary and superstitious manner, marking them apart from others. And once they stray away from the eyes and monitoring of others, down in the dark depths of a hive city or a cruiser, who knows what they're getting up to, uncovering or conversing about. And this is when you start to stray into dangerous territory, where reclamators may find some technology that they may even sell on to disreputable rogue traders, or it's even been said to criminal gangs. All of this and more draws the attention of inquisitors either to supervise, utilize their various skills and unethical attributes, or to persecute them. 
Rogue traders can also be an associate of inquisitors, but as I have extensively discussed in my rogue trader video, they may also work with and form a long-term ongoing association with an inquisitor. The role to which a rogue trader could play in assisting is almost without limitation. From practical transport, no questions asked about cargo, information about their travels, their contacts, their leads, the list goes on and on. And again, if you want to watch my rogue trader video, it'll give you an overall better impression about what they are all about. So then we come to a very curious individual who is known to assist inquisitors. And these are known as sages. They are to all intents human computers. They originate by usually being scholars or record keepers, basically administratum members, who become more than slightly obsessed with their daily tasks. For some, this then spirals out of control into a kind of administrative psychosis, where they become ever more obsessive about uncovering every single detail of information. They become addicted to it and reliant on the satisfaction that it gives them about uncovering detail. They'll show no outward sign of a problem, but for those who know the signs, leaving one of these characters without a processing task can quickly deteriorate them into a similar state of withdrawal as those deprived of a more physical drug. But for an inquisitor, these sages are very valuable as they can basically be tossed into an archive and just left to get on with it. Their extreme diligence means that while they're unlikely to miss any details and uncover lost knowledge that's vital, it also raises the possibility of them inadvertently sharing these secrets with others, because usually they're not going to be in a stable state of mind to consider the wider context of their actions or who they're talking to. So consequently, many sages serving inquisitors are permanently gagged, or more unpleasantly and unfortunately more commonly, their vocal ability is in fact surgically removed. This leaves them only able to communicate when given the tools to scrawl vast reams of scratchy inked texts. Eventually, these sages or auto-savants will either collapse from mental exhaustion, unable to satisfy their ever all-consuming need for information processing, or the arguably lucky few can be consigned to one of the Imperial Administratum's ancient data repositories. These absolutely vast archives can span entire planets, and for the sage, they are now left to, just all intents and purposes, an ocean of information to collate. Limitless, because although this is not the case literally, they will succumb to death long before they can process even a fraction of the information stored. Seekers are another category of security force, so to no surprise they usually originate from the Arbites, and in this they are usually either known as arbitrators or enforcers, sometimes judges, or what is known as the Morturge who essentially sanctioned killers. Seekers, overall, will do the work of apprehension for an inquisitor. If somebody needs to be brought before them, hopefully alive, this is the kind of task suited for a seeker. They are essentially muscle for an inquisitorial retinue, experienced in dealing with the criminal elements and violent areas of a hive city, dragging away suspects for preliminary interrogation to ascertain if they're worth the higher members of an inquisitor's retinue spending their valuable time on. And then of course we have Space Marines. Now, if necessary, an Inquisitor can and will call on the Astartes, although this will very much likely be those known as the Death Watch or the Grey Knights. Can I summarise the Death Watch in a paragraph? No. But they are, in essence, Xenos specialists and operate in much smaller teams than standard Space Marines. They're also drawn from all chapters, so a single kill team may be comprised of multiple Marines, each from a different chapter background. And I could go into a lot more detail, obviously, but that would be a very wild tangent. Now also tech priests beyond the reclamators may work in association with an inquisitor, although it may be that the tech priest is somewhat more supervising the inquisitor, or vice versa. Both will likely have an agenda that is not completely revealed to the other, and it's a bonding of necessity, usually rather than of choice. Tech priests bring highly specialised knowledge, as do inquisitors. It is a good example of the highly compartmentalised nature of the Imperium and the limitations suffered by humanity in its age of technological stagnation and fear of those beyond the Mechanicus having access to such information. Lastly, for inquisitorial assistance, we have the generically titled Warriors. Now, who do you think would befit such a fairly straightforward designation? It is, of course, it basically encompasses the wide-ranging human fighters of the Imperial Guard, from stormtroopers to regular guardsmen, veterans, feral warriors, servitors, even penal legions. An Inquisitor can never have enough disposable firepower, and although you probably wouldn't say it to their face, in the eyes of an Inquisitor few are more disposable than human warriors in the grand view of things, by which all Inquisitors with their overarching collective goals perceive the galaxy by. 
In the vast galactic empire of the Imperium, certain representatives are more common than others. Space Marines, for as widely shown as they are, actually are an extremely small group of individuals in the vast scheme of things. The vast majority of Imperial citizens will never even come close to laying eyes upon an Astartes, let alone interact with one. The Imperial Guard, on the other hand, are almost everywhere. Inquisitors are significantly fewer, in fact, minuscule by comparison to these other groups. And for that reason, some Inquisitors may never encounter other Inquisitors. They may not even encounter other high-ranking officials of the Imperium for years, decades, even centuries. But one reason I want to speak to this before we cover the various Ordos of the Inquisition is because while the Ordos are essentially the roles and objective focus for Inquisitors, they are additionally grouped by belonging to various factions, which constitute what the philosophical outlook is of an Inquisitor. And when they find themselves aligning toward one way or the other, they're more likely to seek out those of similar factions, or at least more inclined to help those roughly aligned to their way of thinking. But how though does an Inquisitor find themselves aligning with different factions? Moreover, how do these ideological factions form in the first place? Well, as I was saying, Inquisitors may find themselves very isolated in the galaxy, encountering events and enemies or revealing technology that raises far more questions than it gives answers. And some questions may shatter and shake an Inquisitor's beliefs to their very core. These periods of isolation can lead to some twisting established thinking, and sometimes live confrontations will occur. Though some Inquisitors may endure a lonely vigil against the darkness that surrounds humanity, most will at some point meet other Inquisitors either during the course of their duties or at specially convened conclaves. And a conclave is simply a meeting between two or more Inquisitors for a brief period of time, essentially a meeting. And here they'll discuss ideas, compare notes, and share generally their outlook towards situations and events in their life. Some more significant meetings are referred to as high conclaves and are said to have lasted for weeks. But it should be underlined that such meetings are not common. These meetings usually will be designated as having a specific agenda, and perhaps for example some sector-wide issue like a Xenos plague or outbreaks of heresy. The Inquisitors want to compare information to orchestrate a more unified approach, or they may be factional, meaning a discussion related to their philosophical beliefs with like-minded Inquisitors. Now, given the nature of communication and travel, gathering together even half a dozen specific individuals in a single place at a certain time requires most conclaves to be restricted in their sphere of influence to a few hundred light years, and must be planned in advance. High conclaves that deal with the most grave matters brought to the attention of the Inquisition can be convened on smaller timescales if required, as astropaths send out urgent missives to Inquisitors across a wider area. But high conclaves are sometimes an ongoing affair that may see several dozen Inquisitors answer the call all told, though perhaps less than half of them will be present on any given day as they arrive or depart as the tides of the warp allow. With the exception of the High Conclaves, which must be held on one of the Inquisition Fortress worlds placed strategically across the Imperium, Conclaves can be convened just about anywhere. Secrecy necessitates that they be conducted somewhere that is secure, and more experienced Inquisitors may well retain or acquire estates, libraries, or bases where such Conclaves can be held. Other critical reasons for a conclave to be convened are, for example, the adjudication between two Inquisitors. As we know, Inquisitors hold power above all, beyond the Emperor himself and their fellow Inquisitors. Thus, it is required that for an Inquisitor to be brought to trial, a fellow Inquisitor must act as a prosecutor. In these situations, an Inquisitor Lord will convene the conclave, often with the accused being in absentia, and a panel of three or more Inquisitors will hear the case to be answered. Any such conclave may find an Inquisitor as being negligent, incompetent, or worse. And the most severe sentence that could be given is that of Traitoris Excommunicate. The Inquisitor is found to be a heretic and is to be hunted down at all costs. It has been known for Inquisitors to declare another Inquisitor traitor without recourse to a conclave, as may be necessary to prevent, say, a deviant from escaping or when the physical conflict is imminent. In such cases, a conclave of inquiry will be held after the events have unfolded, and sometimes such conclaves do not occur within the lifetime of the accused or the accuser, and they must make their judgement based on whatever evidence remains. But given the flexible mission of the Inquisition and the individuals that make up its ranks, such trial conclaves are limited in the punishments they can mete out on the guilty party. One cannot simply stop being an Inquisitor, and so censures and other threats actually carry little weight. Most often the guilty party may be subject to further examination, 
in itself not a pleasant experience, and this is usually enough to provide an Inquisitor with a new incentive to re-examine their priorities and their agenda. Any conclave has the power to commission what is known as a cabal in order to investigate a particular matter. As with many things in the Inquisition, the line between what constitutes a cabal and a conclave are not especially clear, particularly in areas where there are few Inquisitors. A conclave though tends to be a meeting of Inquisitors over a short period of simply sharing information and then based off of that it could determine the need for a cabal which is essentially like a task force charged with the prosecution of a particularly sensitive concern that may have arisen from that. Cabals though, unlike conclaves, do not necessarily have a predetermined endpoint, and so this can lead to them being despised as being kind of secretive societies that can ultimately then be a cause of creating unnecessary inner factions fragmentation within a conclave. However, they have been shown to be also highly effective in combining and focusing the activities of various inquisitors on a particular scheme, so cabals have often achieved pretty noteworthy successes. Lastly then you have cells or splinter cells. These are essentially small temporary fragmented cooperations between inquisitors. A cell will often be formed to confront a particular problem, a demonic manifestation for example. And when this sort of threat reoccurs, an inquisitor may call upon his or her old cell to confront this new menace. In this way a cell may lie dormant for years or even decades before the cell is sent out and inquisitors gather again. In order to maintain security, or dependent on the situation to maintain cover, agents for one Inquisitor in a cell may not know who else their master is working with, and an Inquisitor will not necessarily know who are the agents of his allies and who are either bystanders or even enemies. To overcome this problem, a cell will often agree on a symbol or set of symbols with which to identify themselves and those operating for them. This can be as subtle as, say, a particular type of stitching used on the hem of robes and coats, or it can be something more open such as the wearing of a particular style of ring or brooch. By these means inquisitors can identify and cooperate with their allies without fear of betraying themselves or their comrades and a cell does not consist solely of inquisitors but also their agents. But this varies from their immediate comrades that accompany them to distant contacts that provide other forms of support or information. When cooperating as part of a cell, an inquisitor may pass on certain details of their informants and allies to other members of the cell. Though it is an unspoken tradition that where possible, an inquisitor only deals with his own aides and confidants unless absolutely necessary. So within the Inquisition, as many of you will know, there are held three core operational distinctions, or ordos, that exist for Inquisitors. And I covered this quite fully in my Eisenhorn video, but for the sake of being comprehensive for this video, here's how it breaks down. The Ordo Xenos are the alien hunters, the extermination of that which is not mankind, and when we say exterminate, it means total obliteration. The Ordo Hereticus deal with, you guessed it, heretics. However, heretic can describe a variety of crimes, usually not exclusively those who have been tainted by chaos. It can also include mutants, rogue psychers, those who defile the holy orders of the emperor, and just about also anything that comes to mind for an inquisitor on any given day. Then finally you have the inquisitors of the Ordo Malleus, and they specialise in the knowledge and destruction of the nightmarish demons who bleed out of the parallel void space known as the Warp, where only chaos exists and all of humanity's worst traits are psychically poured into it, saturating it with unimaginable horrors. Now there is, of course, more detail to each of these, but in essence that is what they're all about. But I will say some small details that are particularly noteworthy, in the case of, for example, the Ordo Xenos, they will also not only exterminate the alien, but also carefully catalogue and record their discoveries. Like I've said, Inquisitors can be very investigative and archive and record keeping, as well as the more combative side. So the Ordo Xenos will often pass on specimens to the biologist for autopsy and for us to discover more about the alien, not for interest of course, only to learn how we might more efficiently kill them in the future. For the Ordo Xenos, they have their own dedicated military support to call upon. These are the Death Watch Astartes, composed entirely of veteran space marines, seconded from the greatest chapters in the galaxy. And the Death Watch are trained and equipped to repel the alien tide that threatens to overwhelm humanity and are an invaluable tool for any Inquisitor seeking to vanquish the Xenos threat. And indeed, some Inquisitors will have very significant ongoing relationships with the Death Watch, others may just call upon them as and when necessary. 
Within the Ordo Hereticus also, pay close attention not only to the heretic within humanity, they also keep a careful eye upon the ecclesiarchy. And that may be surprising, but they focus on the ecclesiarchy as it is the religious cult of the emperor, which now saturates all worlds of humanity. And the inquisitors of the Hereticus keep a watch upon the ever-zealous ecclesiarchy so as to ensure they do not get ideas above their station that could become problematic, because this usually means dampening down wars of faith or any of those within its ranks who declare themselves with too much power, as this has been a continual problem within the Imperium. As with any extreme faith, sometimes those high-ranking officials can abuse the trust of their followers so as to adopt their delusion of choice. The Hereticus are also those who monitor the Arbites, the Astartes and Sororitas. Although it is notable that the Sororitas also, as we said, are technically part of the Ecclesiarchy, this is commonly misunderstood because they also simultaneously operate under the banner of the Inquisition. So it's a very strange situation of overlap, where they actually operate similarly to the Death Watch with the Ordo Xenos. The Sororitas are the militant wing under the banner of the Ordo Hereticus, but they also work for the Ecclesiarchy. So usually they're called forth when a battle must be waged, which demands absolute purity of spirit. This is really their specialty. And then lastly you have the Ordo Malleus, who fight against the nightmarish horrors of the warp, the true demon fighters. The most noteworthy aspect of the Malleus is that their militant wing are the Grey Knight Astartes, and quite honestly, that should be all that's required to say about them. So then lastly, I would just make brief mention of something that I've said before, but it's important because it confuses many, and that is that just because an Inquisitor is aligned primarily with a specific Ordo, it does not mean that they are singularly restricted to this path. For example, an Ordo Hereticus Inquisitor might start out investigating a report about a heretical cult, only to discover that it was in fact having Xenos-related origins. Now, at that point they could continue on and deal with it themselves, or maybe if they felt it necessary they may call upon a fellow Inquisitor that specialises within that area. This can obviously be played out in various combinations. But the important point being that just because you belong to one Ordo does not mean that you're restricted to that one area of investigation or action. You may just be directing more towards missions and tasks which involve that discipline because you're more experienced with it. It's much more about individuals dealing with situations that they're best suited to. But this doesn't mean that they're prohibited from addressing other situations as well. Ordos are really thought of best as being more like a field of study than a designated specialist unit. I'll also say that the Inquisition operate quite similarly to the Grey Knights, in that often they will hide in the shadows and cover their tracks by either suppression of witnesses, destruction of all records, or seizure of evidence. Or in extreme cases they may resort to, like the Grey Knights, straight up mind wipes or even execution if all else fails. However, unlike the Grey Knights, the Inquisition will also use fear as a weapon in the population. Some factions of the Inquisition will even count on their presence and the fear that comes with it for all to see and create waves of purging to occur within a population prior to their arrival. In fact, sometimes the mere mention of an Inquisition party travelling to a world is enough to spark fear, driving purges where neighbours turn against one another and vigilantes become suddenly common in an all-out effort to be seen as doing their duty and displaying themselves as true servants for the Imperium and the Emperor. As is always the case within the Inquisition, this kind of internalised disorder is seen by other factions as being entirely damaging and very counterproductive especially if it weakens the status quo and risks later reprisals. But make no mistake, little of anything is outside the control of an Inquisitor. Indeed, entire sections of Imperial bureaucracy have been known to simply disappear for presumably some unforgivable infraction. Now, as is so often the case with the Imperium, many smaller groups and fragmented elements exist beyond the well-established norms we see throughout its sprawling organisation. The Inquisition is no exception, and any number of small groups have defined themselves as minor ordos, except that these can amount to barely more than a few individuals with a shared goal. Some, though, are considerably larger and have more embedded roles, and there are certainly more than I can care to fully list here. So this is not a definitive list today, as some have fairly menial roles, like the Ordo Astra, tasked with stellar cartography. But of the more interesting minor ordos, and in no specific order, let's study these. Firstly, one of the most recent to appear is known as the Ordo Maledictum, and they have risen during the Indomitus era, and seek to close the great rift that has torn the galaxy asunder. Good luck with that, I guess. 
The Ordo Sicarius were established during the Age of Apostasy, a time of great disruption and dangerous internal war for the Imperium. This also led to the rise of the Thorians, but we'll come to those in the next video. The Sicarius is assigned the unenviable task of policing Imperial Assassins and the Assassinorum. Ever since this period in the 36th millennium, Assassins could technically only be deployed under the total authority of the High Lords of Terror and now Primarch Gulliman. However, this is for obvious reasons absurdly impractical. And so the Sicarius basically become the middle management for the Assassinorum. However, this presents obvious questions about their potential to abuse this quite powerful authority. But then probably anybody who might raise that question is going to end up being assassinated. The Ordo Sepultura are another new minor Ordo to originate from the Plague Wars, and they exist to investigate a specific threat, the Zombie Plague. Within the galaxy of the 41st millennium, although zombification and plague zombies, also brain leaf zombies in underhives, have been known about for millennia, it wasn't until the 13th Black Crusade that they posed enough of a threat to have a dedicated Ordo set up to address the threat. The similarities though between resurrection of these zombie plagues and the operation of the Golden Throne has not passed by the Inquisitorial Thorian faction, who have taken a very close interest in these developments. And again, the reason for that will become clear later. The Ordo Originatus is dedicated to unravelling 10 millennia of myths, exaggeration and lies within the Imperium and even human history before that, which honestly is sometimes how I am feeling. Conversely though, the Ordo Redactus continually look to obscure all the details of the past, thereby making the efforts of the Ordo Originatus ultimately futile, which is also how I sometimes feel. Their rationalisation for this is that they seek to prevent the enemies of humanity from learning some secret or aspect that they could gain an advantage from understanding the Inquisition's earliest days. And I think I just want to underscore the fact that as I have talked before about what we know and don't know about the Imperium and just the galaxy within the 41st millennium, it's worth noting that there is actually a specific Inquisitorial Ordo who are tasked simply with making everything really confusing, covering things up, spreading false truths so that you never get down to the real truth of the matter, and I think that's something that's really worth keeping in mind. I will make mention also of an almost by now certainly redundant Ordo known only as the 11th. And that's not really a name, they just happen to be the 11th Ordo and don't go by any other known title. And once they focus their efforts on limiting the independence of the Adeptus Astartes, and quite rightly as well, because I can think of some yellow marines that should really be taken a close look at just off the top of my head. In seriousness though, they have really fallen off into obscurity because they came about kind of post heresy. Their original purpose in the aftermath of the heresy has long since become largely irrelevant because the breakup of the legions occurred, the system of the Astartes chapters was implemented in what is known as the second founding. So this event heavily limited the power of the Astartes but thereby undermined the Ordo's entire purpose for existing. So it's very doubtful to this day that any exist, but you never know, there may be some out there wandering the galaxy with a chip on their shoulder and a belief that the Astartes are way too powerful and too dangerous to exist. Again, good luck with that. The Ordo Kronos, or Kronos, however you want, investigate the potential consequences of time travel, specifically though, warp travel. This has long been a problematic issue for humanity, as the disparity between time in the warp and the material space has been known to cause all manner of issues. Kronos are also interested in specifically seeking those who might see the potential for deliberate manipulation of this phenomenon. Kronos have also seemingly vanished from both record and presence in the Imperium. There is no explanation for what happened or where they have disappeared to. Any number of wild theories have been speculated upon, but with little evidence, it's anybody's guess as to why they vanished. The Ordo Machinum keep a watch, or as much of a watch as they can, over the Adeptus Mechanicus. Undoubtedly a full-time affair, because the Mechanicus love to acquire all manner of spurious technology, scuttling back to their underground forges and uploading data to their vast library of information. It's long been speculated that the Mechanicus board endless vaults of technology and that they could potentially already have far more access to the STC schematics than they have allowed to be visibly seen in the Imperium. In essence, the Mechanicus are believed by some to be hedging their bets in case the Imperium should one day turn against them. Not forgetting, of course, they also retain ownership of the Titans. 
Inquisitors of the Ordo Machinum will often accompany Mechanicus archaeological teams to distant worlds to physically observe and report upon just exactly what has been recovered. They will regularly collaborate with the Ordo Xenos to again assess any alien technology that the Adeptus Mechanicus seek to recover. The Ordo Militum does what it says on the tin, it monitors the Imperium's military bodies such as the Astra Militarum, Imperial Navy, Imperially Sanctioned Psychers, Adeptus Astartes and in close partnership with the Ordo Hereticus, also the Sororitas. It's worth remembering that again the Inquisition are not singularly concerned with necessarily chaos heretics but any manner of abuse or internal actions that could damage or undermine the effectiveness of imperial power and that could very much be those seeking power for power's sake at the expense of the security of the Imperium. The Ordo Scriptorum are still based on terror and its members are dedicated to the examination and investigation of records and communiques. Within the Imperium nothing can be more greatly misjudged than the importance of its bureaucracy. For all the war and heroics and miracles and horror the tedious, emotionless bureaucracy is what the core of the Imperium is all about. It struggles every single day under the weight of this burden, and it's impossible to even know how many tomes of vital information have been lost, misfiled or destroyed through simple human error. The bureaucracy of the Imperium you see is like a vast machine of human servants who spend their whole lives, every moment of every day, checking administrative documents. And you could readily imagine how one archivist or scribe who is tasked with checking thousands of orders and communications every day could at some time come across a single page and somewhere lost within the reams of information is vital information, a fragment of knowledge. But because it's been incorrectly filed or stamped wrongly, those errors immediately invalidate its authenticity and so that information is never to be seen again. This nightmarish frustration of such blinkered operative bureaucracy is what the Scriptorum Ordo battle against. They're only able to intercept a handful of these failures, but even one can prove the difference between the life and death of billions. Moreover, the presence of an Inquisitor can have an unsurprising motivational effect upon an Administratum scribe's work, thus ensuring that fewer errors will occur in the future. Of course, on the more severe end of the scale, should a scribe make a devastating error and incorrectly process a form that could doom billions by not delivering them with the support that they need, the punishment for members of the Administratum can be understandably severe and permanent. The Ordo Hydra were an extremist element of what were once known as the Illuminati, and that is a whole other fairly complex story. But this group essentially held the goal of destroying chaos but by any means necessary. This group of Illuminati were also referred to as a Cabal, the Cabal, or an Inquisitorial Cabal. They were defeated by the actions of the Inquisitor Draco, who prevented them from unleashing a plot to unify humanity as a single hive mind. This was intended to provide mankind with the ability to destroy the Chaos Gods once and for all, but was more likely to result in the birth of a fifth major Chaos God, who would render the human race extinct and guarantee the final victory of chaos. As I say though, there is a lot more to the story, but in essence, this is the overview. If you want to read about this, by the way, it did exist as an omnibus at one time, but this appears no longer available. Individually, it exists as three books, Draco, Harlequin, and Chaos Child, and these are still available from the Black Library. I believe there are five in total, but these are the three most critical. Ordo Obsoletus tend to encounter the entity known as Zinch more than others, as they often will reveal how a miraculous event is a genuine manifestation of the Emperor's will or some scheming plot of either Xenos or chaotic deception. Figures such as the highly mythical Legion of the Damned and the reappearances of a certain Lord Varlak that I'll clarify further shortly, the size and scope of Obsoletus is unknown and it's possible they do not even meet the requirements to be classified as an Ordo and are more possibly what's known as a Conclave. But before we learn of Conclaves, let us explore for a moment the lost tale of Lord Varlak and an example of the mysterious events Inquisitors have to deal with. Korsk II was a typical backwater Imperial world. A peasant population toils while a technocratic elite rules from a handful of cities. Thanks to its moderate strategic importance coupled with a recent rebellion which was immediately crushed, Korsk II is garrisoned by several regiments of Imperial Guard. Within this guard force exists a rogue psyker by the name of Lord Varlak, who reportedly began his career as Corporal Varlak 
a private force of the Vos cartel during the 24th Meridian War. You'd be hard pressed to find documentation of him or these events now though, as all records have been long since purged and only those with the presence of mind to record any hard copies of documents from the aftermath could know anything related to what transpired. So after the Vos cartel went bankrupt, Valak fled from the city of Vos and joined an obscure cult of the Emperor Mortified. When he returned from this bizarre time in the wilderness, Valak began preaching wild dogma to the citizens of Korsk. A surprising amount of the population were taken by his words, despite them apparently being blatant heresy. It appeared that he had developed the power to convince anyone with whom he spoke that his words were the solid gold truth and should be obeyed without question, which goes to demonstrate the danger psychers can pose to the Imperium far beyond casting a tedious smite at every opportunity. Valak had discovered no matter how outrageous or untruthful his words, no one ever questioned him. And so quickly he was able to abuse this to his benefit and convince the commanders of the Imperial troops that he was in fact their saviour and the Emperor and the Astartes were in fact the enemy. His plot to reign over the world may have gone on for far longer were it not for one Inquisitor, Marcus, who by chance happened to be on the world and quickly sending word to Terra and ordering reinforcements of Space Wolves, Blood and Dark Angels and the Ultramarines soon descended upon Korsk II. In coordination with the Inquisitor, they quickly began an assault to crush this rebellion and destroy Varlak, who was holed up in his command bunker. Dawn spilled through the bunker's vision slits to form parallel bars of light and dark across the rockcrete floor. The tall cloaked figure paced back and forth through the patches of illumination, humming quietly to himself. Guardsmen stood ramrod straight nearby, obediently waiting for their orders. One of their number lay at their feet, crumpled in a heap the dark stain leaking from his head forming a pool across the floor. It didn't pay to bring bad news to the attention of Lord Varlak. The pacing figure stopped suddenly and swung around on his heel with a theatrical slowness. A bald, high-browed forehead shone above cruel eyes and lips which twisted into a sickly smile. It's still not here, is it? he said. No, no sir. sir. The chorused voice of the guardsman was deafening in the confined bunker. Varlak winced before raising his bolt pistol and blowing a fist-sized hole in the nearest guardsman. The body collapsed, and Lord Varlak, the now self-declared autarch of Korsk II, resumed his pacing. The guardsmen did not move a muscle. They knew that their lord was under a lot of pressure, and that his acts of apparently random violence were always directed at cowards, traitors, shirkers and other scum. After all, he told them so himself. Nonetheless, it was a source of considerable relief when they heard the thudding blades of an approaching airlift. Varlak stepped over to one of the vision slits. Aha! He said almost to himself. Those space marines won't catch me now, breakthrough or no breakthrough. The long dark body of the lifter was visible now, twin rotors hauling its ponderous bulk towards the landing pad. It slowed and turned preparing to land just as beams of ruby light slammed down from above, like the wrath of God. The lifter expelled flames and thick black smoke before rolling over, breaking into three pieces as it tumbled from the sky. Shattered pieces of lifter rattled off the bunker as a small mushroom cloud rose over the crash site. Varlak grimaced and put his head in his hands. After a while, he turned to address the assembled guardsmen, cold witchfire burning in his eyes. You see what happens when you have filthy scumbag traitors in your ranks? He paused to viciously kick one of the prone fighters with his elegant boots. Now we'll have to wait for the reinforcements. The guardsmen all nodded glassily, caught in the liquid harmonics of his voice like insects in honey. Get out there and man the guns. Make sure no space marines get in here. The guardsmen doubled out of the chamber and moments later, Varlak heard engines starting up and the shouts of men preparing for battle. He gazed through the slits to the north, where a great plume of dust marked the approach of the Emperor's accursed space marines. Glancing back to the animated map on the far wall, he could see his three columns of reinforcements also closing in. The four groups on the map raced towards the complex in a deadly contest. As he watched the first space marine missiles landing nearby, the bunker shook and dust floated from the ceiling. It was going to be a close call. The battle did not progress well for Varlak's Imperial puppets. An immense tank battle ensued with all four Space Marine chapters descending upon Varlak's Imperial tank sections who were supported by horseback rough riders and a personal guard of Ogryn. After some initial success, a continually aggressive assault by the Astartes doomed the Renegade. And when things looked finally lost, he attempted an escape. 
but it was not long before Varlock would be finally incinerated by an incandescent superheated blast of multi-melt of fire delivered by a swooping Space Wolves land speeder. Yet strangely, after this incident, it was rumoured that Varlock was once seen again on Necromunda, a third time on Vanor 21. But wouldn't you know it, I've been unable to find any physical documentation to corroborate this. It would appear that Ordo Obsoletus or just the wider Inquisition have removed all records of such events. But there remains the possibility that these apparent later appearances suggest that Varlak was not killed on Korsk, but instead used his powerful psychic ability of persuasion to convince even the Astartes in their minds that he had been destroyed, when in fact he had escaped. The critical point of this illustration is that for the Inquisition, one single rogue psyker is able to not only bring a planet to the point of being completely lost, but this single person also engineered a situation where massive resources had to be deployed to correct the situation. And this is why, whether they are simply a minor ordo or a major one within the Inquisition, their mission spans the entire galaxy. A thankless, unending task that requires continual emotionless diligence, for to an Inquisitor, every citizen is a potential enemy for humanity and none should be overlooked. Now it is often said that there's no real official hierarchy within the Inquisition or that it operates without this. However, this obviously cannot be completely true. The sheer nature of the activities demands some level of ranking and organisation. This is not as clearly defined as you might observe in a military chain of command, it's more based around reputation and title, which yes, is sort of a ranking system. As I said, it's similar to the nature of the Inquisition itself, it's vague, it's not very clearly defined. So seniority in and of itself can play just as much of a role as can respect of successful campaigns. It's also undoubtedly highly dependent on the faction an Inquisitor belongs to, because one respected Inquisitor may be another's heretic. Despite how the Inquisition is commonly represented, there is a need for a higher tier of Inquisitor to help maintain the integrity of the Inquisition and to watch over the rest of the organisation and the marshalling of resources. So generally speaking, you have your standard Inquisitors, then you have Inquisitor Lords, Grand Masters, Masters, and then the Inquisitorial Representative. So first of all, a representative of the Inquisition is fairly as it sounds, a person who represents the Inquisition overall. Now this is actually a good example of how the Imperium does not represent one singular political system. And this is often a mistake people make when they talk about the Inquisition. And this is actually a good example of how the Imperium does not represent one singular political system, but is in fact a mishmash of various outlooks. And it's a fair question to ask, what political structure is the Imperium? But the truth is, it's very complicated. It's not really one thing. It's a mishmash, it's a blending of different things, and it's very dependent on where you are in the galaxy, and what level you're at, and all these kind of different things. And this is a fairly good example of this, because the Inquisitorial representative is essentially elected by other Inquisitor Lords, and basically they vote for who they want to be the representative. Except, this representative is then assigned to what was formerly the High Lords of Terror, although this obviously no longer exists because now Robert Goleman has disbanded it, having seen it as being stagnant and a bureaucratic shambles. However, just as you may have other senior figures like the Fabricator General of Mars, you'll continue, who by the way had a parliament, you'll continue to have an inquisitorial representative. But interestingly, again, similar to a democratic rule, an inquisitorial representative may only serve for a limited term, usually five Terran years, before stepping down to allow a new inquisitor lord to take that position. This is an interesting aspect of authority, and again, it's a surprising detail that people may not usually associate with an organisation such as the Inquisition, which tends to be more kind of disconnected and, as we said at the beginning, kind of feudal in nature. And that's really the most interesting thing when it comes to the Imperium, actually, is that it's kind of like this blending mishmash of things wherever it suits. It's not really one thing, it's much more grey. Part of the reason this whole process seems to be so smooth, and this is kind of important, is that the position itself holds a little more meaning beyond being a position of great honour. Because beyond that, the representative serves essentially as more like a messenger for the Inquisitional organisation at large. And this is another example of while technically, yes, the Inquisition have unlimited authority, only answerable to the Emperor, in reality, this is not really how things play out. It's more kind of a theoretical thing. Because if they were to, say, alienate any one or several of the other major organisations within the Imperium, like, say, the Astartes or the Mechanicus, this could be very catastrophic for the Inquisition. 
and so they have to play a level of political tact and care that's required. On a day-to-day -day level, your standard Inquisitor can execute as many nameless pleb citizens as they deem appropriate, but things at senior levels are rarely so straightforward. In essence, the representative of the Inquisition, whilst being an Inquisitor Lord, is basically just a mouthpiece for the Org overall, and they're going to relay any major threats or upcoming events so that the Imperium can react and assign appropriate forces. The times when Inquisitorial representative has not been present within the senior governing body of the Imperium, though, has often resulted in catastrophic consequences. So whilst on the one hand they can kind of seem not that important, on the other they can actually have a very significant role in preventing major disasters. So what about these Inquisitor Lords? Are they quite simply just senior Inquisitors? Well, this happens as we mentioned by more reputation than anything else. Although influence undoubtedly plays a strong part, as is ever the case, it's more about who you know and not so much what you know. Becoming an Inquisitor Lord only happens when other Inquisitor Lords invite you to take that role, and this will only occur, as we say, after they are well-established and proven dedicated servants of the Inquisition. This position, though, is much more symbolic than a literal assignment of power, because Inquisitors, young or old, have technically the same ability to demand whatever they deem necessary, whether you're a newly fledged Inquisitor or have been doing it for decades. So becoming an Inquisitor Lord is much more about recognition and that lower, less experienced Inquisitors should likely bow to your judgement. However, this is not necessarily universally true as again, the position is noteworthy more than being an actual rank that denotes any structural chain of command. And again, Inquisitorial Grand Masters are similarly titled only as they have risen to a level of respect enough to command a sector or subsector of Imperial territory. So there is, again, some structure there, but not too strictly. An Inquisitorial Master, again, much the same, is assigned to a Lord who has a strong presence in their Ordo, as it exists within a sector or subsector. Both of these ranks will have the ability to make what amounts to senior level decisions about activities, but again, these are not necessarily permanent positions. They exist more as a means to facilitate organisation, more than being about permanent recognition of that position and as being an Inquisitor Lord. So it's important to understand it's not at all the same as, say, being an Astartes Chapter Master or an Imperial Guard General. Where these roles are usually obviously not strictly permanent, barring some terrible misjudgement, these positions tend to exist until death. But for Inquisitor Lords, they may rise to what amounts to be a higher rank, but only hold it for as long as is necessary, and that usually is entirely undetermined periods of time. So then we come to Inquisitorial Psychic Mastery and their disciplines. The latent strength and ability, the range of a psychic, is usually measured on a standardised scale known as the assignment, although other systems exist. And this is a complex measuring system, but to break it down more simply, we can understand it as follows. A standard range of psychic activity is measured by a 24 character scale that runs Omega, Psi, Chi, Phi, Upsilon, Tau, Sigma, Rho, Pi, Omicron, Xi, Nu, Mu, Lambda, Kappa, Iota, Theta, Eta, Zeta, Epsilon, Delta, Gamma, Beta, Alpha. Now within that, baseline human mental activity is marked as being Rho or Pi. Pi is the limit of non-active sentience. Designations of Omicron through to Kappa indicate residual psi-activity that the subject under scrutiny is normally not aware of and which may pass unnoticed except under careful observations. Iota and upward indicates a manifest psi-activity or ability, the strength increasing exponentially with each designation, and ratings of Zeta and higher indicate a very powerful psi-talent. The top four ratings designate master-level powers or talents of the kind found once in every billion humans. The Inquisition constantly survey to locate, identify and sequester any and all psychics, and it's intended to catch anyone with a higher rating of Omicron or above, but in practice those of Kappa and higher are usually identified. A rating of Iota or above requires immediate inquisitorial response, either being confinement or even mandatory execution. Below the baseline rating though of human Pi, the grading runs into the region of the Psi inert, which refers to individuals whose minds are so blunt that they are oblivious to psychic activity or even probing. 
and this runs again on a sliding scale and someone with an upsilon grade may only be affected by a very severe psychic power but remain otherwise inert. Omega rating indicates a more extreme level of inert psychic status. They are in fact so blunt as to be having a measurable anti-psi effect. These are really the blanks, the nulls, whose very presence is painful to those with moderate to high psychic ability. Not only will they nullify them, but they will cause them high levels of discomfort, unease, even pain. On the other end of the scale, it is possible to achieve a rating of alpha in what is known as the plus scale. These are some of the most powerful and most dangerous individuals. So for example, Alpha Plus, they are thankfully very rare because they represent extreme danger to not just the Imperium, but the wider galaxy and usually the individual themselves. The Plus designation can be applied to other levels too, like Beta and Gamma, but it is not believed to be applicable below Zeta. It's generally believed that only Xenos are capable of tolerating the power of Alpha Plus, like for example Tyranids. And humans are only able to survive at a level of Beta Plus and higher. The sheer scale of channeling such psychic power robs them of their sanity, and any human with Alpha Plus levels are nearly always completely insane, but examples of Alpha Plus human psychers have been found and held captive by the Inquisition. It's thought that for a being to occupy a level below Zeta Plus, they would actually theoretically no longer exist physically and in fact become a non-corporeal entity. So while it is common, it's not necessary for an Inquisitor to be a Psyker. In fact, some of the Puritan branches of the Inquisition barely tolerate Psykers, if not actively hunting them down, and that includes even fellow members of the Inquisition. Psykers have always been something of a double-edged sword, because on the one hand they're very powerful individuals who can manifest and utilise wondrous abilities that defy all manifest logic, on the other hand, they can be unpredictable, and worse, directly interacting with the warp, untrained psychers can have their minds torn apart by the power of the warp, or even allow themselves inadvertently to become a gateway to allow a pathway for the horrors contained within demons. Within those who are what are referred to as imperially sanctioned psychers though, there are six main disciplines. Biomancy is the ability to manipulate biological matter and energy at a cellular level. Telepathy is of course to do with manipulating and invading the minds of others. It also enables telepaths like astropaths to communicate between each other with just a thought over a great distance. Mastery of telepathy as a skill means that a psyker can even twist others' perceptions and emotions, altering their thoughts and actions through either a form of inception or simply restructuring of their memory. This can turn a mortal enemy into a new ally, and there's no need to drag hidden information from a captive if you can then turn them into an ally who will then just volunteer the information you seek without having to dig around in the maze of their mind. It's actually a very disturbing concept that you could approach as an enemy and then the psyker can actually distort your mind to the point where you're not really under any kind of duress, you're simply now perceiving them as an ally, and that concept is very strange. Psychers with what's referred to as telekinesis is an ability to manipulate the material verse. This means bending the laws of physics or in, case, or in some cases even breaking them. Pyromancers are psychers who hold mastery over fire, which seems somewhat simplistic compared to some of these other abilities. Psychers known as demonologists are those who have studied much about chaos and its forms and these psychers understand much about the processes between the materium and immaterium and how that power can be channeled. Beyond that, demonologists are able to use some of the powerful skills that inhabitants of the warp have learned. This can include things like teleportation as they're able to open gateways to the warp and pass through it to reach their destination over short or even long distances. And it should be no surprise that this tends to be the discipline of more likely a radical inquisitor as such intimate contact with the warp comes with great peril. However, it does give them powerful abilities like being able to ban banish warp entities back from whence they came as well. Lastly, Theosophamy, and this discipline focuses on the manipulation of the warp and how it interacts with the materium based on ritualistic control, not simply raw power. And this is actually a very important discipline, because what it can be used for is to either disrupt or seal breaks between the two spaces of the materium and the immaterium. As opposed to the ordinary concept of warp rituals where you imagine these focus purely on opening a breach into the warp space as carried out by say a chaotic cult or something like this, the obvious use for theosophy by an inquisitor is that when you may say locate a heretical cult who have been attempting to open a gateway, it's all well and good if as an inquisitor you can track down and locate a cult. 
But if you're unable to seal that breach, if you're unable to stop the entities coming out from that nightmare realm, then just finding the instigators is going to be something that's irrelevant. Once demons are pouring out of that breach, you're unable to do anything about it. So whilst it might seem something of a defensive ability, for an Inquisitor, this is actually an incredibly important discipline. And again, something that's not especially widely considered. Now I want to conclude this first video about Inquisitors in considering a final point of interest, which remains true throughout the Imperium. And that is to say that a great many events and truths within the Imperium are hazy and subject to interpretation at the best of times. Within the Inquisition, many of their factional core beliefs and ideological differences when considered objectively rarely give us one definitive way of looking at something. Even within a faction, one's heretic is another saviour. The point being that as much as humanity views chaos as being abhorrent and disgusting, those who serve chaos do not necessarily see themselves in that perspective. As we will explore in part two, radical inquisitors also do not necessarily see themselves as being radical in the negative framing that Puritans and loyalists would present them as. In fact, radical or if you like heretical inquisitors see themselves in entirely the opposite way as still benefiting the future of humanity. A radical inquisitor will consider themselves to have awoken to the truth of things, a reality that the majority simply choose not to see, but that they have managed to achieve by their strength of mind, a strength which Puritan inquisitors either do not possess or fear to test. Radicals see themselves as being something akin to martyrs who understand the weight of their task, that they must keep the courage to do what must be done, and any cause to the contrary only further entrench their beliefs. But this fight between Puritan and Radical remains a permanently problematic issue within the Inquisition. But regardless of whether they are Puritan or Radical, in regard to their philosophical outlook, the inquisitorial view to achieve one's goals by any means necessary remains a constant. And this unfortunately carries with it the devastating consequences for ordinary members of the Imperium. Yet, of course, depending on which side of the coin any one Inquisitor is looking at, those necessary means may vary wildly, and the subsequent associated consequences scale from being simply inconvenient to permanently world-ending. Now all of this today is barely scratching the surface of what it means to be an Inquisitor. What we've looked at, the fundamental mechanics of being an Inquisitor, and it's very much the how and not the why. So soon in part two, which you'll be pleased to know is already well in progress and will follow on, and I mean soon, we will dig down into the ideologies of the Inquisitors. And this is where we will learn about what it truly means to serve as one of the most powerful forces in the Imperium. We'll drill down on the ideologies of the Puritan and the Radical and explore how the strangely fractured nature of the Inquisition came about in the first place. Most importantly though, we'll consider which of these ideologies seems most probable and benefiting for the future of humanity and the Imperium. By the finish of it, you yourself can undoubtedly decide which faction you best align with, those who seek complete annihilation of humanity's enemies, or those seeking the growth and rebirth of humanity, or other factions with far more disturbing and twisted agendas. As always guys, I will say thank you very much indeed for joining me today. If you enjoyed this video, please drop a like, tell me what you think down below, and I'll also quickly say, I know this one has been a long time coming, but we're back on track, and next time we will explore much more detail about the Inquisition. See you next time.